good morning and welcome to this course on fluid dynamics and turbo machines. Uh, this course will be taught in two modules. The first module is on fluid dynamics. The second one is uh, on turbo machines. The first part, the first module will be taught by me. I am Dr. Shamit Bakshi. The second part which deals with turbo machines will be taught by Dr. Dhiman Chatterjee. In this first module, uh, I have divided uh, it into four parts. So, uh, we will begin uh, the first part is actually on introduction to fluid flow. So, this will be the lectures which will be given during the first week of this course. So, we will start with the, our first lecture. So, what uh, let us look at the slides now. So, what you can see here, so let us see what we actually mean by a fluid flow and what are the applications, why, why do we need to study fluid flow. So, uh, this is basically what you see here, this arrows pointing towards right, uh, these are uh, this are indicative of a flow in the sense these are like velocity vector, Ve uh, velocity is a vector quantity. So, we indicate it by both magnitude and the direction. So, this is like a flow. Now, uh, uh, let us say we have a plate, a flat plate in front of this flow. So, what happens? Uh, this is easy to imagine what will happen and we all know that, that there is a, the, a force starts acting on the plate and the plate starts moving, I am sorry. So, the plate starts moving in the direction of the flow. Now, uh, let us also look at the flow in a little different situation. So, now we have the flow and we have a plate instead of being perp kept perpendicular to the direction of the flow, we have now inclined the plate a little bit. So, now what happens is this the same uh, uh, the situation is similar, but not the same. So, what happens now the plate now moves in a different trajectory. So, it moves approximately in this way. So, in the first case we have a drag force, a force acting in the direction of the flow. In the second case we have a drag force and a lift force. So, a force which acts in the direction of the flow and a force which act perpendicular to the direction of the flow which is called lift. So, this is a situation which is easy for us to imagine. Now, why do what interests us to study this kind of uh, situations or this kind of flows is that if we uh, if we can study uh, fluid mechanics or fluid dynamics, uh, we can answer some questions. So, uh, say for the first situation, we can answer what is the magnitude of the drag force which is acting on this plate. Uh, now, the question is why do we need to know this answer? The answer to that question is that, that it helps us a similar situation exist in the case of the fluid dynamic force which turns the turbine, turns a turbine. So, the hydrodynamic drag force is used to turn a turbine. So, that makes sense to estimate uh, this turbine, uh, the forces acting on the turbine and thereby to estimate the power generated therein. And so, this is a situation, this is a kind of turbine, you can see the flow and you can see that uh, we can get this kind of answers by a, our study of fluid flow. In the second situation, uh, we can ask questions like how is the lift generated? Like we have a flow in the direction from left to right and we have a force which is perpendicular to the direction of the flow. The lift force is perpendicular to the direction of the flow. So, starting from first principles, can we find out how is this lift generated? So, uh, our study of fluid mechanics will, will help us to answer this question. 
And again from the point of view of the applications, this is very important because this lift force is certainly needed for uh, applications where in uh, you know flight dynamics, flight applications like in the case of aeroplane simply. So, uh, there what we want to do is not only that we want to estimate the lift and drag, we want to reduce drag and increase lift. So, uh, see the situation which has been demonstrated here, here the plate uh, uh, is moving and there is a flow, but a similar situation can be thought of when you have the plate moving, but the flow the surrounding is stationary, it is very similar to that, fluid dynamically it is very similar to that. Now, in that that is the case of an aeroplane uh, uh, flying in the sky. So, in that case uh, the drag force is actually acting against the direction of the plane and the lift force is helping to helping it to fly, helping it to uh, support the uh, load of the plane and also the payload. So, basically lift is useful and drag is undesirable. So, can we reduce drag and increase lift? So, if you see uh, I can give an example which may we all of us may be familiar with we take a case of a paper aeroplane which is a very simple thing, actual aeroplane is very complicated. So, if you see probably all of us have made this kind of planes, uh, small things uh, during our school days and you know flown it in during the class in the classrooms. So, uh, even in the uh, making of this there is understanding of or uh, of fluid dynamics. See what motivates uh, let us ask the question that in this shape what motivates the triangular shape of this aeroplane of this paper aeroplane. The answer which I can think about is that here the motivation is to reduce drag because when the aeroplane is flying you can think of if you look at it from the side it is very similar to this plate. So, a lift is generated here which helps the aeroplane to get lifted after we uh, throw it in the sky and the drag can be reduced in this case by reducing the frontal area in the plane. Frontal area is the area which is seen by seeing from the direction of the flow. If we look at the plane from the direction of the flow, the area which we see is the frontal area. The drag is proportional to the frontal area and that can be reduced if you use a triangular shape instead of a rectangular shape here. So, that motivates the uh, design, so the small which uh, unconsciously we take this uh, kind of a shape and we see that this helps us to explain the fluid dynamics helps us to explain the shape. So, you can easily think of, uh, think of uh, the kind of aerodynamics which is which goes into the understanding of aerodynamics which goes into making up a real aeroplane if uh, this is only a paper aeroplane. Uh, these two examples one that of a tur turbine another that of uh, an aeroplane which we took are just two examples and you can cite numerous examples on applications of fluid flow starting from microfluidics to uh, very large scale flows. And, uh, so, we can easily understand that uh, this has a wide range of application fluid dynamics has a wide range of applications. With this we with this motivation we start now start looking at what is fluid. So, uh, basically the perspective of fluid from uh, the point of view of fluid mechanics is little different from that which we are familiar with, uh, because uh, what we are familiar with uh, from our previous understanding is uh, you know we talk about different states of uh, matter uh, solid liquid gas, but when you talk about fluid in fluid mechanics it is not just the state of matter. So, what is it? So, basically the perspective of fluid in fluid mechanics is how it is not about what is the state of the matter, it is about how the state responds to an applied force. Because we are talking when we are talking about fluid dynamics or fluid mechanics, uh, we are talking about 
forces. So, the definition of fluid is very much related to the applied force. So, that means fluid response uh, responds differently than solids when a force is applied to it. So, now let us take an example of a solid and uh, when we have said uh, the applied force you can have two situations. You can apply a normal force like what is shown here that means the direction of the force is perpendicular to the direction of uh, to the surface on which it is acting. So, this is a purely normal force. So, let us see how the solid it is known to us if we apply this force the solid changes its volume and uh, when you withdraw this force it comes back to its original uh, shape and size. Of course, this is only true if the force which we have applied uh, is within keeps the solid within its elastic limit. So, what we say is that solid actually behaves elastically on application of a force on application of a normal force. We do it for the fluid also. So, this is a container which has some fluid and we apply a normal force onto it. So, what happens this is also well known to us it actually again deforms. So, as it deforms uh, again if we withdraw this normal force it comes back to its original uh, volume. So, its volume changes and it comes back to its original volume. So, what it means is the fluid actually res uh, with respect to the normal force the uh, behavior of the fluid is very much like that of a solid it is no different from that of a solid. So, when is it different? In fact, uh, this is very much uh, the change of volume of uh, solid or fluid due to application of normal force. This is very much related to the bulk modulus which is a material property both for both solids and fluids. Uh, and this is related of course, we can understand uh, that this would be related to the compressibility of the material. So, bulk modulus uh, the reciprocal of bulk modulus is basically compressibility. So, higher the bulk modulus of a material less compressibility is it or it is more difficult to deform a material which has higher bulk modulus. You can take an example like say for example, in the case of metals uh, let us take steel it has a bulk modulus of uh, 160 giga Pascal. Whereas, in the case of uh, liquids let us take the case of water uh, the bulk modulus of water is about 2 giga Pascal. So, 180th of what you see for the case of steel. So, it has a much lower uh, bulk modulus. So, that means it is easier to actually deform fluids which is of course, probably uh, uh, intuitive. Uh, it is easy to deform fluids than solids. If you talk about gases they have even lesser bulk modulus for example, uh, for air the bul bulk modulus is about 0.1 mega Pascal. So, we are talking about giga Pascal now we are talking about mega Pascal 0.1 mega Pascal is far far below that of solid or fluids. So, that means the compressibility of air or gases generally is very high, uh, but it does not mean that air has to be always treated as a compressible flow. We will talk we will touch upon this point later uh, during this uh, chapter itself this uh, part of our lecture. So, uh, it may be uh, uh, the compressibility is high, but the flow may not be compressible because it depends on other features also. So, we will talk about it later. Now, uh, uh, like I uh, introduced this is uh, basically the definition of mathematical definition of bulk modulus. It is uh, applied uh, pressure divided by. So, if you in the denominator if you write d v by v it is like percentage change in volume. So, relative change in volume. So, applied pressure divided by change in volume or in terms of density also you can write. Uh, now, this was the response 
of uh, solid or fluid with respect to normal force and they are very similar. They are very similar uh, to each other. So, this is not something which distinguishes a solid from a fluid. So, what distinguishes a solid from a fluid will be understood better if we now take the same solid and uh, we apply a shear force. So, now we apply a shear force. The shear force is uh, parallel to the surface. Okay. So, uh, uh, when we apply a shear force to the solid, what is the behavior? This is also quite understandable and uh, it is called also intuitive. So, we apply the shear force, the solid again deforms and when you withdraw this, it comes back to its original shape. So, uh, in this case solid behaves actually again of course, the applied shear should be within the elastic limit of the solid. So, again the solid even under the application of a shear force behaves elastically. Now, let us see what a fluid does. So, we take the situation very similar to the uh, previous situation and now we have a plate we apply uh, okay before going into that uh, i have just uh, shown a particular point here this signifies actually a fluid particle uh, very soon we will define what is a fluid particle but uh, let us say this is a fluid particle this is a particle of fluid now let us see when we apply a shear force to this top plate what happens to this fluid particle so, as we apply this shear force, the fluid particle moves from its initial to the final position like uh, what happened in the case of solid also. Now, when you, but what happened, what uh, is different in the case of fluid is when we withdraw this force, the fluid particle, I am sorry, the fluid particle remains in its deformed position. So, it does not come back and the applied uh, shear force could be as little as you can think of whatever may be the what, however small the shear force could be there will be a, a movement of the fluid particle and it will not come back to its original position automatically. So, it does not display any elasticity. So, there is no so the uh, energy spent in moving the particle in case of a solid is returned when you withdraw the force because it comes back to its original uh, shape and size and thereby the energy is returned. But here where does the energy go? The energy gets dissipated through something called viscosity. So, what happens here is that the fluid uh, has uh, different uh, we will see in the next slide has different molecules. So, this interaction takes up this energy and finally, dissipates it as heat. So, basically what we see here is under the application of a shear force, the fluid behaves in a viscous way, in a dissipative way whereas, the solid behaves elastically. So, this is the main difference between solid and fluid. Now, the uh, okay, so uh, we have given uh, we have stated made the same statement here that fluids continuously flow on application of a shear force. Uh, that means, whatever may be the small, uh, small whatever small however small the force may be it will constantly flow. That means, it will the uh, par fluid particles will move and it will not come back to its original position. So, this is basically what makes a fluid different from a solid. So, uh, as we had discussed the fluids are viscous whereas, solids are elastic within the elastic and the uh, fluids within the elastic limits of course, for the solid and for the uh, fluids uh, uh, there is no even for a very small application of very small force it starts behaving in a viscous way. So, you can think of it the uh, think of solids as similar to a spring because uh, the same thing happens on in a spring you deform it, it comes back to its original, uh, uh, you, uh, you deform it and when you release the force, it comes back to its original size. That is, that is how they are elastic, whereas uh, fluids 
are something like dampers. So, it gets dissipated the energy which you spend on the fluid it gets dissipated like in the case of a damper. It is not like that all the materials which we see around us if we have to define it uh, in a uh, in the language of fluid mechanics we can distinguish them into only two uh, divisions like solids and uh, uh, solids and fluids or viscous or, or elastic elastic and viscous there are materials which uh, have a combination of both those are known as viscoelastic materials the very uh, good example of this are biological tissues so what happens is when you apply a force on this they undergo some uh, they undergo some permanent deformation they flow like fluid but when you release the force it behaves to some extent elastically so some uh, some energy some part of the energy is returned through elasticity so it is a combination of both of course you, if you have to talk about those materials you have to talk uh, in terms or model those materials you have to consider both a spring and a damper spring and a damper system so from this place uh, we at least get some idea about what is a fluid let us uh, now go to the next slide which deals with the continuum concept uh, which is very familiar for classical mechanics and of course in fluid mechanics so this is a this is basically an assumption which we have to make for doing all the kinds of analysis which are going to which we are going to do uh, in our study of fluid dynamics so it uh, the uh, word continuum means that it is a continuous medium but uh, is it really a continuous medium it is not so let us see what is it so if we look at a fluid the fluid has lot of uh, molecules which are randomly moving in space so any fluid you take so there are uh, several millions of molecules which constantly interact with each other and uh, the majority of the part is the space between the molecules and this is empty so this is not a continuous medium you have molecules and in between them you have lot of space but in our analysis we do not consider those space we say that it is continuous everywhere there is ma matter within the fluid so this is basically our continuum assumption but what we have we have to understand is uh, when can this assumption be applied suppose if we take up a space or a region which has no molecules in it okay you can always think of a space where there is no molecules between it is a space between two molecules so there is no matter there so there is no fluid there we cannot use uh, this assumption in under those situations so to get into little more details on uh, about that so let us consider this volume so this red circle shown within the fluid domain is a small volume let us magnify this so if we magnify and try to see it it is a very small volume so it has some counted number of molecules inside it okay if you can it is countable let us say, let us say 10 11 something like that now if we try to talk about some property within this small volume let us take an example of density as a property so what happens is these molecules are not stationary molecules they are constantly moving so at a particular time you might have let us say 10 molecules in the next time instant you in the same volume if you look at you might have 12 molecules you might have 5 molecules so if the volume is very small to begin with the number of molecules within that volume will be very small and as uh, as a result of that if we have to define a property like density which is mass of all the molecules divided by the volume we will see that this density will vary constantly with time so we cannot define a property like density in the fluid domain 
this problem will not arise if we take a little bigger volume. So, if you see a bigger circle now, if we consider this volume and if we try to look at it, we will see there are <coughs> there are a lot of molecules within this volume and let us say it has about 10 to the power 20 molecules. And it may so happen that in the next time in instant it has some 100 molecules more or 50 molecules less or 200 molecules less. That variation of 10 or 100 or 50 or 200 in a number of 10 to the power 20 will not make a big difference for a property like density like the total mass of the molecule divided by vo volume. So, we can define a property like density of the medium. We can see it uh, okay. So, uh, before going uh, into uh, the aspect of density further, we can say that this thing which we have taken out from the fluid we, we, which we are looking into the fluid is essentially this minimum volume which is required to call the fluid as a fluid is known as a fluid particle. We will uh, keep on using uh, this terminology time and again during our discussion on fluid flow. So, this is the minimum volume uh, which is required to uh, call a fluid as a fluid. Uh, now, we will also talk about that volume very soon. Now, let us say we were talking about density, let us plot this density with respect to this with respect to delta V. What is delta V? Delta V is basically this elemental volume. So, uh, it can be very small to big. Now, uh, if it is very small that the elemental volume is very small, so that the number of molecules within that volume is very less. If that is the situation and if we plot density here, we will see that in this region there is a random fluctuation of density and this is due to the microscopic uncertainty in the number of molecules within that volume. Whereas, if you look at uh, of course, if you look at uh, a volume uh, larger than some kind of a threshold volume which is uh, the volume which is required to uh, call a uh, to define a fluid particle like this that has more or less constant density. So, the density there is no random fluctuation this is now it can be defined as a property of the fluid. Of course, if you go further down means at for larger volumes you can see that there is a macroscopic variation of there could be a mas macroscopic variation of density. This could be due to the variation in temperature at a region where the temperature is less the density will be high and uh, so and so forth. So, this macroscopic variations will not show the random fluctuations as displayed in the region where the elemental volume was very small. So, now this is basically delta V prime is the uh, minimum volume which you need to consider for con uh, calling this material as a continuum. Uh, now, let us look at, so this is macroscopic variation as we uh, already discussed, this is the region, this is the volume which you need to consider for considering this as a continuum, the fluid as a continuum and we will always make this assumption in our, uh, in this course. Now, the uh, uh, for a continuum the advantage is you can define uh, continuous fields like that of density. You can say now I can once I have taken this volume I can define density at different points within this fluid. We will very soon look at other uh, different properties also which can be continuously defined within the continuum. Now, the next question is that we have uh, conveniently showed here delta V prime as the minimum volume which is required to uh, call this uh, to treat the fluid as a continuum, uh, what is the magnitude is of this volume. 
So, we have put a question mark here to emphasize uh, what is the condition, when can we call fluid as a continuum. To answer this question, we will not directly deal with volume, we will rather deal with length scale. So, there is a property, uh, there, there is a parameter which is uh, defined as Knudsen number, which is essentially the ratio of the mean free path of the molecule in the flow divided by the characteristic length scale. Now, what is mean free path? Mean free path is basically the distance traveled by the molecule between two collisions. The uh, particle, the uh, molecules are constantly colliding with each other that is well known. Now, if you have a very densely packed molecules that means, high density situation then they will collide more frequently or in other sense in terms of length scale they will collide within smaller lengths as compared to if the fluid is rarefied that means, it is not so densely packed the molecules are not so densely packed. Now, that is basically the mean free path the distance uh, traveled by the molecule between two collision average of uh, the distance which is traveled by the molecule between two consecutive collisions. L is the length scale of the fluid flow. So, just to give an this can be demonstrated better with an example. So, this is like the characteristics length characteristic length of the flow. So, for example, in the case of a pipe flow the diameter is a good length scale. Now, this uh, parameter is important to define when we uh, want to see whether our continuum assumption can be applied to a particular situation or not. So, if you see for Knudsen number less than 10 to the power minus 3, you can certainly call it as a continuum, uh, you can certainly uh, consider this uh, as a continuous medium and with no slip. <coughs> so, this is a situation where you have uh, the length scale of the flow which is 1000 times the mean free path. So, certainly under that situation mean free path of the molecule. So, certainly under this situation the continuum assumption will hold good and in fact, you can use no slip there. The, the no slip means that if the fluid uh, is near to the let us say this is a wall, if the fluid is near to the wall, the fluid particle is near to the wall, the velocity of the fluid particle will be same as the velocity of the wall. Uh, but it does not mean that the molecules near the walls are stationary, they are actually randomly moving like elsewhere. But when you define a fluid particle like this, then uh, the net movement of the fluid particle is 0. So, that is how that is what we mean by no slip condition. What is once we get into continuum mechanics, we mostly deal, deal with the fluid particles and we forget about molecules, we forget about the existence of the molecules. Now, uh, if the Knudsen number uh, is between uh, 10 to the power minus 3 to 0.1, it becomes a slip flow, it is slightly rarefied flow, still uh, the mean free path is less than the characteristics length scale, but uh, there will be slip in the wall. That means, the fact that molecules are moving randomly moving near the wall uh, has to be accounted for and there will be slip, there will no slip will not be valid. If we go to higher Knudsen number like from 0.1 to 10, okay, so this is a 10 is a situation like where the mean uh, free path uh, is uh, basically 10 times the length scale of the flow, characteristics length scale of the flow. So, this is moderately rarefied and this is a transition region, higher than 10 it is like a free molecular flow. So, this uh, in this region, this is a highly rarefied region that means, in this region what happens is, it is almost like the molecules uh, intermolecular interaction is very less, the molecule is moving freely in the medium. Of course, we are not going to uh, look into any of the th three situations given below, we will only look at continuum flow with no slip condition, this is good enough for us for our fluid dynamics which can be used for turbo machinery applications. So, now 
we uh, know about uh, this assumption continuum assumption we can we can uh, find out we can uh, estimate a situation uh, given uh, the length scale and find out whether we can use the continuum assumption we can whether use we can use continuum pro define continuous properties within a particular flow so one very important property of a flow field is the velocity field because uh, velocity is the most important indicator of the flow see density you can have even without flow also but velocity if the velocity is there within the fluid then the flow the uh, uh, the question of flow comes into picture so let us see what is a velocity field of course we can define a velocity field like a density field when the continuum assumption is valid it is not that we are not familiar with velocity field but again the velocity field when you talk about uh, in a, a fluid dynamics application uh, or continuum fluid dynamics application uh, the definition of velocity is little different from what we are familiar with. Of course, velocity here also it is a vector and it has it is a uh, three dimensional it is a function of both space and time. So, if it is a function of time that means the velocity at a uh, ok. So, before going into that, uh, so what velocity means in the case of a fluid flow or in case of a continuum is that it is a velocity at a point and not for a velocity of a fluid particle or any particle or any object. So, generally by talking about velocity what we mean is the velocity for example, velocity of a train, velocity of a bus or a projectile or a molecule, but when you are talking about velocity of a flow it does not mean that the velocity it part does not pertain to the velocity of a particle or any object, it is velocity at a particular point this is basically the approach taken in the fluid mechanics application. Now, when we are talking about a 2D steady fluid flow ok that means the word steady means that it does not change with time anything which is not changing with time is basically steady. So, that means uh, this flow when it is uh, a function of time it is unsteady. So, 2D means that uh, it is the only two velocities are non-zero like Vx and Vy let us say Vz is 0, but that is not sufficient to be 2D to be really two dimensional uh, it is not sufficient if just Vz is 0. It is also important that Vx and Vy which are non-zero should not vary along z direction. So, Vx and Vy, Vx and Vy are only functions of x and y and not function of z if you go along the z direction v x and v y should not change at the same time v z is also 0. So, let us say this is we uh, take an example of a two dimensional steady fluid flow this is a example of that. So, this is vectorically represented as x i hat i hat is the unit vector in the x direction and j hat is the unit vector in y direction. So, this is a particular fluid flow where basically the velocity of the fluid in the x direction has the mag same magnitude as the location. That means, if it is the if we are talking about a location which is 0.1 comma 0.1 the x directional velocity is also 0.1 y directional velocity is minus 0.1. So, if you look at this fluid velocity field now I, I have plotted it here in a particular uh, domain you see it looks like this it looks something like this. So, as you move towards the center 0 comma 0 both the x and y velocity comes to 0. As you move along the x direction the x velocity increases, but the y velocity is 0 or very small. Similarly, if we move along the y direction then uh, the x velocity is close to 0 y velocity is negative. So, this is a flow situation which will be defined by this flow field. We can define flow field like this in the case of uh, uh, in a continuous medium. Now, we can do another thing we can actually draw a line in such a way that any point on the line uh, if you draw a tangent at any point on the line it signifies the direction of the velocity vector. So, this is 
a line like that and such a line is called a streamline. We will formally define this in the next slide. But uh, to demonstrate uh, some aspect of velocity field, we have uh, brought the streamline in this particular slide. So, basically this is a streamline and this is a particular streamline which passes through the point, point 0.9 comma uh, 0.9. So, now let us consider a uh, fluid particle like we had defined in the previous slide, it is basically a cluster of molecules within which it is the smallest uh, volume within which the continuum there are sufficiently large number of molecules that it continuum assumptions can be applied. So, we consider a fluid particle here, the location is uh, 0 0.9 comma 0 0.9, the magnitude of velocity so is 0 0.9 comma 0 0.9 same as 0 0.9 comma minus 0 0.9 and the magnitude is like this 0 0.9 square square root of 0 0.9 square like any vector quantity. So, uh, because this is a steady flow the any particle will actually follow the streamline it will go along the streamline why it will it go along the streamline because see uh, the streamline has one particular property that perpendicular to the streamline there is no flow because there cannot be any flow as the direction tangent to the streamline is the direction of the flow. So, perpendicular normal to the streamline there is no component of velocity and as a result of that there is no flow. So, if there is no flow in the direction perpendicular to the streamline, so under a steady state situation when the streamline is not uh, changing with time, the fluid particle has no choice rather than other than following the streamline itself. So, it just follows the streamline. So, we have marked one fluid particle at the point 0 0.9 comma 0 0.9. Let us see a second instant here. So, the fluid particle actually moves along the streamline and comes to this position. So, as it comes to this position, the new position uh, which is 3 comma 0.275, what has it done? It has actually accelerated in x direction because its initial x velocity was 0.9 and the final x velocity is 3 in some units let us say meter per second. So, it has accelerated in x direction, but in the y direction the velocity has changed from minus 0 0.9 to minus 0 0.275. So, it has decelerated in the y direction. So, this brings a very important uh, discussion that the fluid particle actually accelerates or decelerates in a flow even if the flow is steady according to our definition of the velocity because the velocity field which we have defined is not the velocity of the fluid particle it is a velocity at a particular point so in this particular case it is a steady velocity it is doesn't it is not changing with time but the fluid particles are accelerating so or decelerating that is why when we, uh, but in a, uh, in general what happens is if we uh, talk about acceleration or deceleration it is actually a time derivative of velocity, but in this case we have to define acceleration in a little different way. So, that we can accommodate the acceleration of the fluid particle because the acceleration is there our definition of fluid particle, uh, our definition of uh, velocity which is defined at a point now and not for a, par a particle uh, should not uh, should not make the acceleration 0. So, the acceleration in this case when the velocity is defined at a point and not that of a fluid particle has to be defined in a different way which we will introduce in the next chapter. Now, if you look at this approach in which the velocity is defined at a point and not for a particle this approach is called Eulerian approach this particular approach in continuum mechanics which is uh, used in continuum mechanics is called Eulerian approach. We do not bother about how the particles, uh, what is the particle velocity, we bother about what is the velocity at a particular point. The second approach is something which of course, we are familiar with where we just follow the uh, fluid particle is called Lagrangian approach. We find out the uh, velocity of the fluid particle at each point. So, 
according to the Lagrangian approach the velocity in this case is changing with time whereas, in the case of Eulerian approach the velocity is independent of time it is a steady velocity. So, the definitions of acceleration in the Eulerian approach is different from that in the case of Lagrangian approach. So, uh, after uh, getting into uh, the fact after getting into the uh, continuum assumptions and seeing that a continuous uh, field can be only defined uh, if the continuum assumption is valid we have also introduced the important uh, uh, parameter the one important characteristics of the flow that is the velocity field. So, this brings us to the end of the first lecture uh, where we have uh, the first lecture deals with the first part of the introduction to fluid flow, uh, where here we have introduced uh, we have initially seen our motivation to study fluid mechanics or fluid dynamics and then uh, we have discussed about what is a fluid and then introduced fluid as a continuum the assumption continuum assumption which is made for uh, the study uh, of fluid dynamics. We have also introduced parameters like density field and velocity field and the two important approaches used in, con, uh, uh, used in relation to fluid flow namely the Eulerian approach and the Lagrangian approach. In the Eulerian approach we look at a particular we uh, focus our attention at a particular point and look at the property at that point like density at that point or velocity at that point. Whereas, in the case of Lagrangian approach we follow a fluid particle a particle and look at the property of the particle like position velocity uh, diameter or uh, sorry that uh, temperature of that particular particle. Thank you.